Everybody excited about what Pastor Brian has for us today? Yeah. Taboo. Yeah, I told him, I said, Pastor Brian, do you want me to get the game? Because I, I have it. He said no. <laughs> so we're excited for service. We're Thank you, worship team. That was such a great day. And it's just so encouraging. Like, I was expecting people just to start leaving because the power was out. But we all stayed in that heart of worship. Amen. It's such a great feeling. So um, I thank you, God. Thank you for everything you have for us today. Thank you for, um, for Pastor Brian and for the word that you've given him in his heart. And I thank you that as he delivers it, Lord, that you are going to be with him and that you're going to give us the heart to receive what you have for us to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone, let's stand to our feet for Pastor Brian Shimatero. <laughs> amen, amen. Can you hear me? There we go. So <clears throat> I'm going to I'm going to ask. Uh, Sarah to stay up here for just a moment. I had something kind of funny that I thought she would appreciate. Uh oh. So, so she was up here today and she was talking a little bit about, um, you know, the the panda picture yeah. earlier today, right? Yep. And you know, I, I remember, you know, one of the things that that we we talk about often is even levels of truth. Okay. You know, we have you know these different things, but ultimately it always comes back down to the the absolute truth, which is the Word of God, right? So it's like you may have a picture of something. Uh, someone else may have another picture of something, but when we come back down to truth always comes back down to the word of God, right? So it talks about layers. So this is what I thought was kind of interesting is, is that the picture of the panda in the basement of the hot tub room uh -huh. is not a picture of a panda. What is it? A tiger? It is actually a picture of a tiger. Oh, shoot. And I thought it was because relevant. Because I couldn't see it. I know. And so I thought it was really relevant today that you even shared on the fact that you thought it was a panda because you had, a, a, you know, a certain amount of revelation or truth that you had about this picture. And but wasn't, wasn't there now little, there's another whole layer to it. But was there not little pandas on the picture? There might be, but the whole picture is actually that of a tiger. Oh, heavens. Well. All right. Let's give a round of applause for Sarah today. <laughs> See how you just walked right into the whole, the whole message. It's excellent. You're welcome. All right. Well. Today, nonetheless, I said, so if you, if you guys have been around for the last little bit, we're going to get right started get, today. You guys ready for that? Yep. All right. So if you guys were around the last few weeks, you know, we were just wrapping up a whole series on rejection. And if you guys were around for that rejection, you know, there was obviously there was things that you realized that we went through when we were younger. And, and as a result of that, I ended up spending a lot of time at Pastor Barb and Dave Pistonese's house. You know, because long before Pastor Barb started getting out her 20, 30, 40,000 words a day, you know, counseling all of you, she was counseling me a lot. This was like a weekly occurrence you know, that I got a lot. And I saw a lot of interesting things over at the Pistonese's house. And some of them I shall never, ever repeat in my life. <laughs> and I know many of you are really curious about whether or not Pastor Barb really cheats at cards. We'll leave that for another day. But there are some things that we want to, I want to get to today that I thought was really interesting that I can share about. One thing that, that happened when, when I was at Pastor Barb's house when I was younger is they had something that many of you who are younger won't have really much recollection or know much about, but all of the, the older crowd probably will, and it was something called an encyclopedia. <laughs> you guys remember encyclopedias? Well, Pastor Barb and Dave had one of the special encyclopedias. You guys remember the Encyclopedia Britannica's? You know, like the $3,000 sets back, you know, 30 years ago. They were all thick as Bibles, you know, with 25 books in them or 26 books. And you couldn't do a research project without, you know, having an encyclopedia around. You guys all know what I'm talking about? You know, now, nowadays they've moved everything over online. And now, you know, I realized even when I was doing research this week that Encyclopedia Britannica is actually online. And you can still get information from them. So... I was looking up this word, because uh, the title of today's message is taboo. So I was looking up this word uh, online and realized that, you know, there's a whole history that actually uh, ended up, you know, coming out of this word taboo. And so what had happened was there was a, an, an individual, his name was James Cook. And in ni I think it was in 1771, he ended up going to the Polynesian Islands, to the place of uh, Tonga, and uh, he invited all of the, the rulers of that particular area to, to come onto his boat, and he had a meal prepared for them. And so, you know what he did? So he invited them all, and then what did he do? You know what? Why don't you please sit down, have some food, eat some food? And he realized that none of them wanted to partake. 
and, and they use this word taboo. And it's like taboo. And what did it mean? It meant it was a forbidden thing. It was something that none of them would, would participate in because it was forbidden. And so anyways, this ended up going uh, on. And, uh, and, and it realizes that, you know, so he took this word, he, he, he started mo using it in the English language, and it started getting, you know, spread about. But we realize that taboo is actually something that is not just in that, that Polynesian culture, but it was something that spread around. And, and we have taboo things in all of our cultures as well, am I right? So what does that word taboo mean? It means, it means banned on grounds of morality uh, or taste or even constituting a risk. Um, it's something that is it's really simple. It's not acceptable to say, to mention, or do. It's something that is taboo. And so why are we talking about taboo today? You know, why are we talking about taboo in church? And, and, uh, and the reason being is because over time, there seems to be certain types of topics that have also become taboo within the church world or taboo to be able to preach about and so fortunately for you guys um you know i'm not real keen on you know taboo right so we're gonna we're gonna be able we're gonna minister today on a taboo subject how many of you guys are up for a taboo subject today the subject that we're going to talk about today is money that is a taboo subject we're going to talk about so you know, when, you know, the first thing you know that happens when you, when you hear the term money come up in church, you know, all these stereotypes start popping up. You know, you get the, you know, all they want is my money. You know, you start thinking about the prosperity preachers, you know, those on the, on the jets that accumulated, you know, masses amount of, um, you know, wealth. But you also have the opposite side of that, too, you know, where people, you know, when they think about money, they, they believe that, you know, every, you know, Christian or preacher or whatever should all be impoverished as well. So there's all kinds of, you know, flip-flops that people have. And a lot of things that we learn about money, we've, we've learned and we've developed even from our childhoods, you know? Like our parents could have taught us lots of things about money. They could have taught us good things, or they could have taught us some bad things, or, or you know, they could have, you know, taught us both of these, right? And we develop these habits, you know, a lot of times in these mindsets about uh, money as, as we've grown up. The interesting thing I want to bring out today is, is that, do you know how many times money is mentioned in God's Word? A lot, about 2,000 times. For a taboo subject, it's talked about 2,000 times in God's word. The interesting part about this, you know how many times in, in, in comparison, prayer is talked about? 500. It's, it's four times more that money is discussed within the Bible than we have even prayer. And so this is a subject that God has for us today. You guys good with learning about what God's word has to say about it? So we're going to start today in Matthew chapter 6. So in Matthew chapter 6 it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures, right, in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. And here's one of the, the famous verses that we like to use. You guys can all repeat it with me. It says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, we've spent quite a bit of time even in that rejection series and, and, and on our theme this year on trusting in the Lord where we've talked a lot about where's your focus? Where's your focus in 2024, right? Is it, is it on the things of God or is it the things of heaven, right? And all of this is, is relevant for us in a lot of different things because in the passage, it's talking about our focus should be on storing up things in heaven and not things here on the earth. No one ever really asks themselves that question. I, I, I think about it sometimes. I think about, what have I really stored up? Sometimes I think about it, you know, in the natural sense. What have I really stored up for treasures here on this earth? You know, you know many of you probably ask that same question, right? But also, I ask that question, what am I storing up in heaven? You know, I, I showed up for church today. Am I going to get a reward for that? I read my Bible yesterday. Is there a reward for that? I, I led somebody to the Lord this day, you know. Is, is, is there a reward for that? You know, see, there's, there's a reward system that God talks about, and it says for us to store up those treasures and those rewards for us 
in heaven. And so I, I've, been, I've been thinking a little bit more about, you know, these types of things. And it says in 1 Corinthians 3, 13 to 15, it brings out, it says, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and that fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work, which he has built on it, endures, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, so yet, or sorry, yet so as through fire. What is that, what is this talking about? It's talking about what we do is important, okay? But also, why we do it is important. The motive of what's going on on the inside of you, why you do something, is relevant as to whether or not it will stand true. And when the fire comes to test it, it will be able to, will it stand or will it burn up? You know, I, we could, I could stand up here and I could preach to you and I could be doing a good work. But if my motivation for doing that is wrong, when I stand before God, it will get burned up because my motivation of my heart is wrong. And that's the same way of all the different things that we do. Because what does God care about? Our heart. It's a heart issue. And that's what it, it comes down to. And this is why we bring out this part about our focus. In, in Matthew 6, 24, it says, no man can serve two masters. So this is a continuation of the passage that we were at. No man can serve two masters. So he talks about where your treasure is, there will your heart be aft. Also, he goes on talking about light and darkness, and then he picks up and says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, or he will love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. And then he says, you cannot serve God and mammon. You know, he brings out that we can't be serving both God, two masters. This is what's really relevant in this particular passage. He says, we can't just both love the world and love the kingdom of God. This is what it's, it's bringing out. It says, and he wraps it up even with another layer after that. So we talk about the world, we talk about the kingdom of God. But then he, then he goes, he goes, you can't serve God and mammon. And so what is this word mammon? This word mammon comes from the word Menimus, say menimus. And it talks about money, it talks about treasure, it talks about wealth, it talks about riches. And here it is, even specifically personified and opposed to God. That's what it's actually talking about when it uses this word man. It actually goes as far as to say it is a false object of worship and devotion. See, mammon actually comes into place as even actually a spirit that is in operation. And what happens with mammon is, is that it's the money, right? It, what happens, it wants you to trust in it instead of God. Look at the one next to you. It says, mammon wants you to trust in it instead of God. Because this here is, is what, what happens, right? You see, money reveals to us what is in operation within our lives, right? This is our reaction to money. This is what happens is it's revealing to us what is going on on the inside. And it shows us where our treasure is and where our focus is. This is what's being revealed in it. See, mammon is a pursuit of or an idolatry of wealth. You know, uh, one of the things I find really interesting about the statement is of all the things that God could possibly compare himself or compete with him as a comparison between a master, he chooses money. Think about that. Everything that's possibly out there that he can make a comparison and an opposite to, he says you can't serve both God and money. God and mammon. That there is a big deal because it shows something that God is saying to us in it. And the reason why I want to bring out about this, right, is in 1 Timothy 6.10, it says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. See, money in itself is not evil. People misquote that all the time. Money is not evil. It says the love of money is evil. 
okay? And that's because there's, a, there's an operation that is taking place on it, right? And here's the thing. It's not even class-specific. It doesn't matter whether you're wealthy or you're poor. You can both have a love for money. All right, you guys got that? And so the second half of the verse, though, really brings out the issue that's at hand. It says, they have erred from the faith. See, everything comes back down to faith. It says that they've erred from the faith in the fact they've put their trust, their reliance, their confidence, their idolatry into money, and they have erred, it says, to the fact that they've even put so much greed into it that they have walked away and they have erred from their faith for money. So when we look at things in God's word, we really want to understand what's happening, and here it goes back down to what is the center of what is happening? What's the center of the things that are going on? Do we have faith in God, or do we have faith in money? Where does that lie? Hebrews 11, 6. I'm going to tell, tell you guys a secret that's not a secret. Everything in God's kingdom comes down to faith. Look at the one next to you and say, it all comes down to faith. <laughs> say it again. It all comes down to faith. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. And then it says in Romans 1.17, it says, For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. You know what it means when you got to live by faith? <laughs> it means that you need to live by faith. It means that you're going to have circumstances that are going to come your way that require you to operate in faith, trust, reliance in God. And this is what the question is when faith comes into the issue here. It says, where's your trust? Is your trust in God? Is your trust in provision? Is your trust in the money? Or is your trust in what God has for you? Here's the thing about mammon. Mammon does not just bring out a financial position for you. It's talking about uh, a trust in the influence that it provides for you. It influences for your status. It influences for your position. It influences for connections and for jobs. You know, even in the Gospel of Luke, when it talks about the steward uh, uh, in the household, it said, Luke 16, 9, it says, And I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon. You know what money can do for you? It can make friends for you. That's what it's talking about here. See, it, it, it goes beyond just making the provision. It goes beyond that because now what it's doing is it's influencing and allowing it in operation within your life so that your trust and your dependence can be on the fact that you can even make friends by it. You can get status by it. You can get connections by it. You can get jobs by it. You can get opportunities by it because this is what is in operation when we're speaking about it. You know, the Bible shares a couple passages even about the rich man and the faith. In Matthew 19, 22, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Assuredly, I say to you, that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then in 1 Timothy 6, 17, it says, Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, in the, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. You know, what, what makes this interesting, right, is, is we, we have this passage here where God says that it's even, it's harder, you know, for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. It even says, it's, you know, it's even easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for the rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And, and, and the, the eye of the needle, by the way, was a really tiny door, you know, going into the walls into Jerusalem where the camel basically would have to get down on his knees and it had to kind of shimmy all the way through. So it was able to do it, but it was difficult. It was hard because when you have wealth, you're more susceptible to relying on that wealth as the provider for you than you are when you don't have anything and you're providing on God to be able to provide for you the next meal. You know, when, when I can certainly tell you, when, when you don't have income or you don't have a job and you don't have food, you're certainly praying a whole lot more to your God to be your provider and trusting to him and where it's coming from than the person who's never had to experience that because they have stores and stores of food and money. 
And so God is talking about these types of things. And see, you know, we, we really need to take a look at where, and he says, he warns us, don't put your trust in money. Don't put your trust there. It says it makes, what does it make? Wings and fly away, as Pastor Luke's pointing out here. But let's, let's jump in. You guys good with me? You guys following me today on this? All right, so I want to talk, I want to read, and, and uh, we want to go in the New Testament to the Gospel of Mark chapter 12. All right, let me just take a sip of this. So in Mark chapter 12, and here it says, and they sent to him, which is Jesus, some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to catch him in his words. When they had come, they said to him, teacher, we know that thou art true, and thou care about nothing, for you do not regard the person of men, but teach the way of God in truth. You know, before I read any further on, I just find it amazing in and of itself. They're literally coming to trap him in his words. And the hypocrites come, and, and then they're like, oh, you're such a wonderful teacher. You teach things in such elements of truth. Please tell us what it is that we want to know the answer to. But they're literally trying to make the man stumble and fall. And so they ask this question, and what is the question that they ask? They ask this and they say, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, says to them, why do you test me? Bring me a denarius that I may see it. And so they brought it and they said to him, whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus answered to them, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. You know, the, the passage here that, that it brings out is, is that they, they were trying to catch Jesus on something, and so they use this whole tax question of, about asking whether or not it was lawful to be able to pay taxes, okay? And I think it's a great kind of uh, example that he can, and so, and I really feel like when I, was, when I was working on this particular message that God kind of just illuminated the simplicity of this passage for me. You know, I may have heard this passage before, but I just believe he just illuminated something that, that was really simple. He says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Now, the thing about this is, he didn't elaborate on that. He says, give to Caesar, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. You know why? Because they all knew what was owed to Caesar. They all knew what the taxes were. You know, here in Ontario, we pay tax. We got HST. If I go down to the store and I, I make a purchase of $100 and then we know that HST is 13%, then I get to pay $13 of HST or sales tax, right? This is what was going on in the days of Caesar, right? They all knew what the tax was. Now, if I decide that I'm gonna go make a $100 purchase and I have $13 tax and I decide, right, that I only, I only wanna give $10, am I gonna be able to receive the, the goods that, that, uh, that I want to purchase? No, because the tax is what is owed to the government for the purchase that I'm about to make. Am I right? And so Jesus is making this example. This is the same, this is the same thing that you know, applies to our income tax. It applies to our HST. So we all understand that. But then God goes on in verse, and he says, And unto God the things that are God's. Once again, this is a part. It was straightforward. He didn't elaborate on it. Render to God. Let's render to Caesar what was Caesar. Render to God what was God's. They didn't come back, and they, they, they didn't say, well, 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 what's God's? Is it $10? Is it hundred dollars? Is it a million dollars? It was the same principle that was in place because they all knew in their culture what was owed and rendered what was due to God. You guys follow me on this? And so in God's word, he brings out one of the things of the principles that he has was it was the same principle. And this is why he uses this tax exam example is because there was also what God has in his word, that of the tithe. Right, and that's what we call it. And the people knew what it was. They knew what the commands were, and they were obedient, right, to be able to follow what the instructions were. They didn't have to ask. He didn't have to clarify. He didn't have to say this, 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 and this. It was here's the simplicity. 
You know what you got to pay in your taxes to Caesar. Render to Caesar what Caesar's. And unto God, you know what is owed to God. Render to God what is God's. You guys following me this morning? So in Leviticus 27, 30, I want to pick up here. It says, and all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's, and it is holy to the Lord. There's a couple things I want to bring out in this passage. The first thing it says, the tithe, it says, it is the Lord's. And then it also uses the word all of it. And then, so, so here's the thing. So it, it talks, there's a, there's a tenth here. That word tithe actually means tenth. And if you look at the different understandings of things related to numbers in the Bible, etc., the word, uh, sorry, the, the number ten, it actually represents a symbol of authority of God and his government of the, on the earth. It's a symbol of obedience and responsibility of people towards God's law. And it's also an associated, uh, uh, number 10 is also associated with testing in God's word. So for instance, how many days was Daniel tested? 10 days. How many, how many plagues were in Egypt? 10 plagues. See, God uses the tithe to test our hearts. That's what, this is what's going on here. It's the, it's the time. So how does he test it? See, it requires faith to be able to use that tithe. Why, why is it? it it's, it's straightforward. Is, is if you have, first of all, you start, you, you say you have 100%. But if you now give 10% to God, now what do you have left? 90%. So you no longer are functioning with 100% self-reliance on yourself. You've now had to bring God into the equation for it. So now you're operating with a 10% principle that is God's and a 90% that is what is for you. And now you need to have faith because now your trust and reliance is not just on yourself, but your trust and reliance has got God mixed into the puzzle. This is where God tests us in the area of the tithe. See, when, when, you, when you do this, right, it goes back to what Jesus was saying with Caesar. He says, what is owed to the government was a percentage, and what was owed to God is also a percentage. And so the, the question here, right, it goes back, was it wasn't a discretionary, it, it wasn't something that was discretionary. It wasn't, well, you know what, I, 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 go, I went shopping, I don't want to pay my 13% HST, I only want to pay 8% of it, or I want to pay 3% of it. Right? It's not discretionary that way. Taxes, what was due to Caesar, was what was due. And when God says that the 10% was what was his, that's what he brings out. And here's the point. God brings us out even a little bit further. What does it say? It says that it is holy unto the Lord. Say the tithe is holy. That word holy actually means it's sacred, hollowed, dedicated, and set apart. It is his Holy possession. Why would anyone want to take from God his holy possession? It is his holy possession that he is referencing to the tithe, and he says that it is his. And then in Mark 12, 17, where it says render, see, that word render isn't even just talking about giving. It's not just give unto Caesar the things that are, it says render unto Caesar, render unto God. And that word render actually speaks of payment, restore what is due, recompense or give back. See, I may give my money to the government for my taxes, but at the end of the day, I'm not really just giving my money. I'm rendering to them what is due to them because there's a tax that's there. It's a payment that I am, I, I want, uh, that, that's taking place. And I really want us to kind of take a, a look at, at really what's happening with this, is, is that why a lot of times, you know, even as we're going through, you know, this particular message today, you know, we ask these questions, and, and, and we're always, a lot of times we, we go back to trying to figure out how does God's word not apply to me? You know, when we take a look at promises within God's word, when we take a look at scriptures, you know, when we read, you know, in God's word where it says, if you obey the commands of the Lord, and it says, blessed shall you be when you go forth, blessed shall you come when you come in. You guys know what I'm talking about. I'm the, uh, blessed shall you be the head and not the tail. You'll be above and beneath, right? Nobody, nobody takes any question about whether or not that applies to them. We all quote that scripture and it applies to us. 
But a lot of times we, we understand what is going on when it comes about our money that we want to look to wonder whether or not this applies to my life and to my circumstances. I want to move on from this, but I think there's a question that, that is really worth uh, you know, asking about. See, God's word talks about the tithe and it talks about the tenth, but he also gives more instruction about it. And it, it, he brings out something called the first fruits. Say first fruits. See, the first fruits bring out in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, it says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all of your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. First of all, that sounds like a pretty cool blessing, right? You honor God with the first fruits, right, which is, which is a representation of the tithe. And it says that you'll, your barns are going to be filled with plenty. Your, your, your vats are going to overflow this day. But there's all kinds of representations of First fruits in God's word. Do you know that in Jeremiah 2, 3, it says, Israel was holiness to the Lord, the first fruits of his increase? Did you know that we are his first fruits? In James 1, 18, it says, of his own will, he, bought, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creation. Did you know that Jesus was the first fruits? says in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, says, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. See, first fruits is a, an example that God has had in his word. I'll give you an example. If I owned an apple orchard, okay, and the harvest starts coming due and the apples are ready to be picked, okay, the first apples that come off of the tree are the first fruits. They're the cream of the crop. They're the good stuff, Right? You don't want the apples that have been the last, the last ones that are going to be picked off of the field, right, you know, in the end, right? And even when, when people go through all these different types of products, right, everyone is aware that the first fruits is the best of the best, right? It's not the leftovers. It's, you know, the leftovers are often even used for other purposes. If you had the king come to your house, would you give him the three-day-old steak that you already cooked once, or would you be providing for them a steak dinner? This is the principle that God is bringing out in his word about the first fruits. I want to give out an example of this because even in, 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 in Genesis, let's go back all the way to the very beginning in Genesis, okay? In Genesis 4, 3 to 5, it says, In the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering, and of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And you know what? Cain was angry about it. It says Cain was angry and his countenance fell. Because there was a principle that Adam and Eve taught their children. And it was not just about the fact that one brought a lamb from their flock and the other brought fruit out of the ground. Because we just read in Leviticus that it said all the fruit that even come out of the ground is a tithe unto the Lord. So it's not talking about the difference between animals and fruit. It was talking about a principle that Cain just came in with an offering. But it says that Abel came in with the first fruits. See, Abe, the, what's implied in the circumstances is that Cain brought something that was not the first fruits, what was, what was commanded, which was the statue, which was the ordinances of God. And as a result, he brought what he wanted to bring and not what God had commanded him to bring. And you know what happened? His offering was rejected because it did not follow the principle that God had in place to bring the first fruits into the tithe, of the tithe into uh, the, the place of, you guys with me on this? You following this? See, this was really important because it's not just about what we bring. It's about do we do it in accordance to what God has actually given us the instructions to do. And that's what was being brought out in this particular case. Another, and here's the thing. This was long before the New Testament. This was long before Moses even came about with the law. This was right here in the very beginning. Another example of this is that in Hebrews 7, 1 to 4, it talks about, and for this, Melchizedek, the king of Sal, them, the priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being translated the king of righteousness, and then to the king of Solomon, meaning king of peace. Without a father, without a mother, without genealogy, having neither the beginning of days or the end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham paid a tenth. Listen, this whole representation is about God. 
and Abraham paying a tithe to God. It says that he went forth and he, he, he conquered the enemy. He brought all of his trained servants and they went forth and they recovered all a lot. And then they, they brought in spoils. And then Abraham took and he paid the tithes, the tenth of it, to God. This was long before Moses even arrived. This was long before the law. Tithing and the first fruits is a principle that God has in his word. And not only is it representative before and not just under the law and a bunch of legalism, but it's also represented that God brings it out in the New Testament where he's talking about pay to Caesar what's Caesar and to God what is God's. You guys following me on this? The first fruits is what God is really bringing out here. And here's the last part of this. It says, and then it says, just as Abraham obtained spoils through the war, it was the increase in his wealth. The other thing that Proverbs 3, 9 says when we, brought, when we read this verse, it says, it says, of all of your increase. That's what the, the passage talks about. It's talking about our increase, right? He paid the tenth on the increase. You know, I get this question all the time. What is increase? Okay, it's, 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 it's your income that came into you. It's, it's the increase of what you brought in to your house. You know, the simplistic, you know, here's the thing, it's not complicated. Increase is increase. You know, do, do, you, do you, if you, so a lot of people ask, you know, what is my tithe, is, is it reflective of? I'm like, well, it's reflective of your increase. How do you determine what it is that you, you have made income-wise through the year? That's the same principle that you're going to apply in this. You know, when I was younger, and I'm not saying you gotta do this, but I just say when I was younger, my dad was really simple. He took our T4s, and then he took what my giving was for the year, and he'd say, these better match. <laughs> and if they didn't match, there was a problem. There was a problem once in our household, you know, when, when somebody's didn't match up. And, uh, and uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that, but there was a problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> But that's just an example, right? And everybody's got different ways that they bring in income and increase, and, you know, I'll let you figure that out. But, and, and so there's a next part, though, here. I want to bring out, you know, let's keep moving. You guys good moving along here? The book of Malachi, or, or as Pastor Rick likes to say, Malachi. It says, for I am the Lord, and I do not change. Therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob, yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances, and you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. So what, what's going on here? He says, listen, you're not keeping the ordinances that I've given you. You're not keeping my commands. And he says, return to me, and I will return to you. And then they say, well, in what way shall we return? You know what thing God says to him? says, will a man rob God? Ouch. He says, yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what ways have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings, you are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough for you to receive it. That's some good stuff there. Yeah. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground and, and you shall, and nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts, and all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. See, you got this whole part here that God's bringing out and he's basically rebuking them because they were robbing him of his holy tithe. We talked about this. But he, he doesn't just leave it about the fact that they've robbed him of the tithe. God gives an instruction in this passage as to even where the tithe belongs. He says, bring it into the storehouse that there may be food, right, or there in abundance, whatever, within my house. See, the storehouse was, was a local temple. It was a place, it was a church, it was the body. So it was a priest then, it was a pastor now. It was there for the needs of the congregation. And God says, you bring that tithe into the storehouse of God. You know, a lot of times I get these questions, you know, where, where people bring up, you know, even these, these other uh, things about, you know, other charities and, and, and uh, parachurch organizations that are all doing a good work to further the, the, the kingdom of God. And they all are. They're all great things that, that are, are meant to be able to fulfill the work that we are here on this earth to be able to do. But they are not the storehouse. They're not the local church. 
Your tithe belongs to the storehouse. And that's what God is saying. It doesn't belong to the parachurch. It doesn't belong to the Christian charity that is out there. There's a way that we sow into those things. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment because they're all important. And we should be giving into those particular areas. But I want to bring this out, first of all, that the promises of God, God says first and foremost, he says, test me. Say, look at the one next to you say, God says, test me. It is the only place in God's word that he says, test me. Interesting. He says, test me. When you do what I have told you to do, when you give your tenth to me, when you activate your faith, test me in this area that I will do what I say that I'm going to do. It says that I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. It says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. I want you to understand what this really means. When he says that he rebukes the devourer, it means that when the devourer comes, the insects come, those, those things come that, that take the money out of your hand. You know, some of you, you can make all kinds of money and it just falls all the way through your fingertips because there's a devourer that is coming in and taking the money out of your hand. But it says in God's word that when you do such, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not touch that which he shall not touch. And it says that your grapes will not fall off the vine before they are ripe. It means it's going to bear much fruit in your life. Then all the nations are going to call you blessed for your land, and they shall be, you shall be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a, as a father spares an obedient child. And then, I, then you will again see the differences between the righteous and the wicked. There are so many promises that God has for us in his word about giving the tithes. And I know that this is something that has been very much a part of my particular life, right, where God, he's opened up those windows. He's rebuked the devourer in our half. And, and I believe that there's these, the principles, right, that God has brought out about the tenth. And he's brought these principles out for us about the first fruits. And he's brought the principles out about where that tithe belongs, right? And so these are all elements. But there's also other ways that we can use our money within God's kingdom. And I want to bring out the next phase that God also tells us about, and this is offerings. And if we take a look in 1 Chronicles 29, 6 to 9, actually, I'm just going to read uh, not verse number 9. It says, and then the people rejoiced, for they had offered willingly, because with a loyal heart they had offered willingly to the Lord, and King David also rejoiced greatly. Here's the thing that happened. David, he was dedicating, and they were, they, were, they were giving into the temple, and David gave of his abundance. You know what happened? The people were excited, and it, and it, and it excited, and then the leaders then all started giving. And then when all the leaders of the land started giving, then the congregation started giving. You know, there was episodes even in the, in the, in the Old Testament where it says that they gave so much they had to restrain the people from giving. Because do you know that we are created to be generous people? Pastor Rick was talking the other day about, you know, those, those, the needs, right? You know, we all have a need to be accepted and we have needs to be loved, but we also have a need to be generous. That is something that God's word brings out in us. And so the thing I want to bring out about offerings is simply this. Offerings are not tithes. We just talked about what a tithe is. A tithe is that first fruit, that 10% that goes to God. Anything that you give above and beyond that 10% is considered an offering. That is what an offering is. You see, this church is based on these same principles. When we established the church, we, we, we have, we said, you know what, I don't want to do just what the bare minimum was. I don't want to just give my tithes. I didn't want to just tithe out as a, as a church. So we talked about this as a team. We said, so what we do as a church, you know what we do, we, when all the money comes in, we give out 10%. But on top of that 10%, we also give another 5% minimum that we give out as an offering that goes out into the community to us. It goes out into these parachurch organizations. It goes out into these missions and these Christian organizations that are taking the specifics within the kingdom of God and getting the job done. And that is part of what we do with our tithe. Okay, and that's what we do with our offering. This is the same principle, you know, that, that Pastor Sherry and myself live by. I don't just preach this up here. We do the same thing. We give 10% of our tithe, 
And we also give another 5% on top of that at a minimum to be able to give as an offering unto God. Why? Because I want to be able to be a generous person and be able to give back unto the Lord the, the goodness out of the abundance of what he has provided for me. And each time that I do all these things, you know what's happening? I'm activating my faith. I'm activating my trust. I'm activating my reliance on God. And see, offerings come down to a few different things. They come down to the need, the seed, and the deed. Okay, these are the ways that we often categorize them. So if there's a, there's a need, for instance, a building, okay, and, and, and you know, so people would so into that an offering, and they would say, hey, you know, here's a million dollars, you know, for you to buy a building. So, you know, if you guys, you know, want to buy a building, you know, and you got a few million dollars, you want to sow that in, that would be a way that you would give an offering into that. The other one is a seed, and just say, you know, well, there's a, there's say a ministry that's taking Bibles, and they're bringing them, you know, throughout the world, and I want to invest into that kingdom, that, those principles, and you would, you would give a seed into that ministry. The other things that take place is, is that there's also the deed. Sometimes, you know what, you can, you can use your hands to be able to build something for the kingdom of God. I had a need the other day, you know, for a box to be built, and you know what, somebody said, I have the time and I have the ability to be able to build the box and so they built the box and so this is a way that offerings come into the house of the Lord you guys following me on this all right so it says in in this last part I want to bring out is the last way that we can utilize in, in, in our money within the kingdom of God is alms in Proverbs 19 17 it says he who has pity on the Lord lends to who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he will pay back what he has given that's some pretty good stuff. What you give to the poor, you lend them to God, and God says he's going to pay you back. And you know what? God always pays his, pays his debts. All right? And, and here it says in Deuteronomy 15, it, it says, You shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from the poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly land, lend him sufficiently for his need, whatever he needs. Right? We're to be generous to the poor. We're to be able to lend to him what we have the ability to land, lend. In Matthew 6, it brings out another thing, and it talks about take heed what you do with your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise, you will have no reward for your father in, uh, from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet like the hypocrites do. Say, hey, I'm giving my money to the poor today. And they sound a trumpet. It says, in the synagogues and in the streets, and it says, you know what? They'll have their glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be a secret, and the Father who sees in secret himself will reward to you openly. Here, I want to bring this out, because a lot of times the scripture gets misquoted a lot, right? And the reference that God is talking about here is almsgiving. Say almsgiving. It means that they are giving to the poor. And when you're giving to the poor, it says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't, don't blast this. Don't embarrass the person that you're doing charity to in this particular case. He's saying that's what he's referring to. He doesn't say that, first of all, about tithes and offerings. Do you know that even in the, in the culture of the day when the Jews would come in, they'd bring their harvest in, it was a whole public display. And as I described to you earlier about David, it said that the leader, David, gave the money, then the leaders were inspired, and then they gave more money, and then the congregation gave more money. And because this was something that when we gave, it was part of the generosity of who we are, it says that God loves a cheerful giver. And so I want to wrap up here. Why don't you guys stand up with me today as we wrap up this last part. I want to read to you a scripture that we already read, and it says, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust nor corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. For if the light of the body, so the light of the body is the eye, and therefore let the eye be good, the whole body shall be full of light. But if the eye be evil, then the whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? Here's a question. Where's our heart today? Where's our trust? Where's our confidence? Are we dependent and trusting in the Lord to be our provider for us? 
Have we included God in the equation? Have we followed God in the statutes and the ordinances that he's given us? Or are we reliant upon ourselves? Are we reliant on our own, um, our own provisions? The word today is a word about faith. It's not about condemnation today, people. It's not about condemnation. It's about edifying to be able to do what is right in the sight of the Lord. And I want to leave you with this verse. It says in 1 John 3, 22, and whatever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in the sight of the Lord. We want to do what is right and pleasing in the sight of God. We want to do what is right and pleasing in the sight of God. Where's your focus? Is your focus on heaven? Is your focus here on earth? You can't serve two masters. Where's your faith? It always comes back down to faith. Where do I have my trust, my confidence? Do I trust that I can do what God instructs me to do and that with that 90% that God will take it further than the hundred. He will open up the windows of heaven. He'll pour out blessings. He'll rebuke the devourer on our sake. There are so many blessings that God says, and he says, test me in this area. Will we test him? Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for this day. I thank you, Lord, that you are alive and that you are well. And Father, maybe we're talking about a taboo subject, but Lord, I know that nothing is taboo to you. Father, I thank you that, Lord, this day, that, Lord Jesus, that there is life that is within us. Father, I thank you for all the faithful men and women, Lord Jesus, in this place. Lord, those who have even sown faithfully into your kingdom. But I pray, Father God, that there's a new revelation, a new illumination, Father, a new hunger and thirst, Lord, that our focus would be on you, that our trust would be on you, that our reliance would be on you. I thank you, Lord, that you are Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who is our provider this day. Lord, we surrender to you as our provider this day. We put ourselves off of the throne of our hearts and we surrender to you. And Lord, we put that faith and confidence in you in the name of Jesus, amen. Hopefully you guys were edified today, encouraged to be able to do that which is right and holy before the Lord God. I wanted to let you guys be aware that the altars, they're open. If you want prayer for salvation, if you want prayer for the gift of tongues, if you need healing in your life, then I just encourage you to come on up to the front and pray. The rest of you guys, you are dismissed and have the best day of your life.